Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. For those challenged with promoting the use of machine learning in an organization and making it more accessible, one key to success is to support data scientists and machine learning engineers with modern processes, tooling, and platforms. This is a topic that we're excited to address here on the podcast with this AI Platforms podcast series, as well as a series of ebooks that we'll be publishing on this topic. The first of these ebooks takes a bottoms up look at AI platforms and is focused on the open source Kubernetes project, which is used to deliver scalable machine learning infrastructure at places like Airbnb, Booking.com, and OpenAI. The second book in the series looks at scaling data science and ML engineering from the top down, exploring the internal platforms that companies like Airbnb, Facebook, and Uber have built, and what enterprises can learn from them. If these are topics you're interested in, and especially if part of your job involves making machine learning more accessible, I'd encourage you to visit twimmelai.com slash AI platforms and sign up to be notified as soon as these books are published. All right. In this episode of our AI platforms podcast series, we're joined by Bi Chung Chen, principal staff engineer and applied researcher at LinkedIn. Bi Chung and I caught up to discuss LinkedIn's internal AI automation platform, ProML, which was built with the hopes of providing a single platform for the entire life cycle of developing, training, deploying, and testing machine learning models at the company. In our conversation, Bi Chung details ProML, breaking down some of its major components, including its feature marketplace, model creation tooling, and training management system, to name just a few. We also discussed LinkedIn's experience bringing ProML to the company's developers and the role the company's AI Academy has played getting them up to speed. We're excited to have LinkedIn as a sponsor and supporter of the show and to include their story in this series. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Bi Chung Chen. Bi Chung is a principal staff engineer and applied researcher at LinkedIn. Bi Chung, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Yeah, it's very nice to be here. I'm excited to have you on and to learn more about what LinkedIn is doing to support its AI efforts. But before we dive into that, you currently lead machine learning algorithms and tooling at LinkedIn. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, your role and uh, your background, how you got to where you are? My current responsibility is to ensure LinkedIn has the right machine learning and AI technology, and also ensure our developers are productive using this technology. I have been always interested in machine learning since college. I still remember that probably uh, 20 years ago, I'm doing neural network for face detection. Uh, then uh, in my PhD study, uh, I was in a database group but my research is always on how to apply machine learning to database systems to make data systems more intelligent. And after I graduated, um, I joined Yahoo Research and started my career in uh, recommender systems. So in addition to publishing papers and also a book on statistical methods for recommender system, uh, we also designed the recommending algorithms for the Yahoo homepage, Yahoo News, and the, some other applications. And something we find to be like very interesting, right, is that for recommendation system to work very well, um, human and the algorithm combination right, is very, very uh, important. So human beings are very good at selecting uh, good candidate articles for recommendation. And then algorithms are very powerful to identify uh, the, the user's interest and do like deep personalization and quickly react to uh, changes in the user behavior. And after that, I uh, joined LinkedIn about like six years ago. Um, I started by working on news recommendation and also feed ranking algorithms. And I'm amazed that LinkedIn has uh, very unique and very rich data sets. So we have uh, 
a pretty large member base, like more than uh, 500 million members and uh, more than 30 million uh, companies and also a lot of like open jobs that people can apply to. Um, and pretty unique, another unique aspect is uh, for every member, right, LinkedIn has very good uh, profiles of those members, which are difficult to, to find other places uh, for web companies. And in addition to those profiles, we have uh, people's connection, we have people's interaction, uh, we have uh, users' activity, people are seeking uh, jobs, people are consuming content on LinkedIn and also learning courses uh, on LinkedIn. And each member also have uh, different roles. Right? Some people are seeking jobs, some people are hiring people, uh, some people are consuming content, some people are using LinkedIn as a platform to publish content. Right? So there's a lot of uh, uh, connections we want to make between users so that everyone has the best opportunities. Um, and after uh, around probably two years ago, I start to lead uh, uh, a group which designs the algorithms and also tools to help uh, LinkedIn to be able to use machine learning and AI technology in all of our products. So you've talked about some of the unique assets that LinkedIn has in terms of uh, its members and, and the profiles and the connections between those members. What are some of the machine learning and AI applications that uh, are in place at, at LinkedIn? Yeah. So... Machine learning is used almost in every product uh, in LinkedIn, right? So just to give a few examples, uh, if you open uh, LinkedIn homepage, you see a feed of updates uh, from your connections, right? So those are articles shared by your connections and also uh, their uh, professional a change, right? for example, they change a job or they have job uh, anniversary. So we, we use machine learning to rank these different type of items uh, so that we can maximize users' engagement. And also uh, in the feed, we also have sponsored updates, right? So company, uh, they uh, pay LinkedIn to put uh, uh, updates in the feed so that they can get uh, attention. And we use machine learning to predict the click rates of these different, uh, more like advice, advertisements and uh, uh, so that uh, we can maximize uh, the revenue and also uh, the advertiser's value. And also we recommend people to people, right? So uh, for social network, uh, growing a person's network is very important, right? So we look at uh, uh, people's connection structure and try to identify uh, the connect strength between two users and then make recommendations that you may be interested in connecting uh, to these people. And we also use machine learning in different uh, uh, search problems, right? So for example, recruiters come to LinkedIn to search for potential candidates. And we use machine learning uh, to help recruiter to find the best candidate that can fit their need. And also in addition to recruiting product, we also have a, a sales solution product to help uh, salespeople to find uh, leads that can lead to potential like sales opportunity. And this is also using machine learning to, to find the right connection between the people. Can you talk a little bit about the, the evolution of tooling for machine learning at LinkedIn? So we started by uh, developing uh, machine learning algorithms on Hadoop. Uh, and I think uh, several years ago, uh, we find that using Hadoop may not be the best or the most efficient way of doing machine learning computation. So we, move, we start to develop algorithms on Spark, and we find that uh, the ML leap coming from the Spark uh, package is not efficient enough. So we develop our own training algorithm called the Photon Connect, P H O. T O N Photon ML, right? And we open source that so that like everyone can also use that. And in addition to algorithms, uh, we also uh, look at uh, how people can deploy model into our production systems. And uh, um, in the past, uh, deploying model into production systems has been pinpoint. 
there's a lot of uh, like co-development that people need to do. And our current effort is to make this whole process as automatic as possible. Okay, and is Photon ML, is that uh, a replacement for MLlib uh, that also runs within Spark, or does that, is there another engine for that? That is a, another engine, and internally, we basically mainly use Photon ML for our model training purpose, and uh, we are not using MLlib because MLlib, uh, at least in our experience, uh, doesn't really scale to the amount of data that we need to process. And so is... Uh, is Photon ML a replacement for Spark or just the MLlib piece? And oh, do you just, still run within Spark? Yeah, that's correct, right? Just a replacement for MLlib. We are still running uh, using Spark. Maybe before we dig deeper into uh, kind of the tooling and platform side, can you talk a little bit about the developer audience for your tooling efforts at LinkedIn? Are you targeting primarily kind of applied researchers or, you know, how diverse is the audience that you're supporting with the, the various tools that you're building? <laughs> the initial audience that we support are the machine learning developers, right? So those are the people who design algorithms for um, our application, right? use machine learning to make the best decision for like different uh, uh, LinkedIn product. Um, that's our initial focus. Um, but at the same time, we also recognize that we really need to scale machine learning development at LinkedIn. Uh, we made an effort to educate our software engineers uh, to be able to apply machine learning. We call that uh, um, AI Academy at LinkedIn. So that is a uh, five-week training program that our engineer can participate to learn about machine learning. And later, they can also apply machine learning to their um, application area. So uh, gradually, uh, the tooling that we're building will also support uh, those people who graduate from uh, AI Academy. Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, past machine learning background, but they are learning to use machine learning and apply machine learning to our applications. Before we kind of dug into the, the, the question about the developer audience, you walked us through this uh, evolution from Hadoop to Spark MLlib to Photon ML. Uh, LinkedIn also has a machine learning pr platform that you call ProML. What's the? That's correct. Tell us about ProML and the relationship between it and these other tools that you've mentioned. Okay, so uh, ProML is a initiative uh, to uh, double productivity of uh, ML developer at LinkedIn, and uh, this platform. Uh, provide uh, functionalities for the entire machine learning life cycle, right? So starting from a feature marketplace, right, in which uh, people can share and find potentially useful features and manage features for their machine learning model. And the second uh, is uh, model creation tooling. So this involves all the tools we use to uh, train machine learning model and also specify the computation logic of machine learning model. So uh, Photo ML right, belongs to this category. So Photo ML is one of the tools in uh, Pro ML uh, ecosystem. And we also develop uh, algorithms to automatically select features and uh, uh, also s automatically selecting hyperparameters right, for your machine learning models. And a third uh, area is model deployment uh, in which we develop tools to manage all the previously trained models and allow users, uh, like LinkedIn internal users, to click on a button to publish the model and then deploy the model into various places in our production uh, systems. And a third, uh, the fourth area is a model inference engine uh, in which we provide the runtime environment to run the model and to serve uh, user traffic. And the fifth area 
is uh, what we call uh, health assurance. So in which we provide tools to automatically monitor the model performance and also data quality to ensure that our models are performing well. And we also uh, provide um, anomaly detection capability so that when something goes wrong, um, we can quickly identify them. And after uh, we identify issues, uh, we also provide debug and explain uh, tooling so that people can investigate and find uh, the reason that caused the issue. Okay. Um, it sounds like there's a ton for us to ton, dig yeah, into right. there. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe let's start at the beginning and talk about the the feature marketplace. What's the motivation for the feature marketplace? Um, so I think feature marketplace is also, I think, one of the quite unique uh, area that we are looking at. Um, so the reason that we start this feature marketplace effort is that uh, in the past, uh, different teams, they have different pipelines to produce features. And what we observe is that uh, um, uh, there are uh, different teams, they develop very similar features. There's a very little leverage across the teams. And also the pipeline that generate features over time get very complicated, right? So we get into a pipeline jungle that at some point uh, for some application become very difficult to manage. So the effort of feature marketplace is to simplify all this so that we provide a abstraction layer. Uh, in this abstraction layer, um, the feature producers they use simple configuration to set up features by defining the location of the feature and the extraction logic of the feature. Uh, after that, uh, the feature users, uh, they can just use a unique name to refer uh, to the feature. And the system will automatically figure out where to get a feature and how to extract a feature. And when you say the feature location, what what are you referring to there? Is that a like a source system, or is it uh, what what are we referring to? Yep. So uh, location refers to the uh, source of uh, uh, the feature. So for example, um, uh, we need features for model training. Uh, offline, right? for example, on Hadoop. Uh, so then the location will be a uh, path on HDFS. Right? And uh, when we do uh, online serving, uh, the features may come from, for example, a key value store. Right? So in that case, the location will be the address of that particular service. So you've got the kind of the the source of the feature data, and then it sounds like you're also providing a way to uh, declaratively specify some sequence of feature transformations. Is that right? Is that part of it? Yeah, that that is correct. Right. So there are a few uh, common logic that uh, people use to uh, produce useful feature. One is uh, um, sliding window aggregation. Right. So basically, you look at a user's past activity and aggregate their activity right, to identify their interest. Right. So for example, um, if we saw that a user frequently click on an article that mentioned a particular company, right, so then we know that the user probably is interested in that company. So one of the concepts that comes up in some of my conversations around you know, features and and repeatable pipelines is the notion of a, a DAG or a graph for applying these different transformations. Are you using some kind of metaphor like that? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, there are two kind of DAGs uh, in our system. So one DAG is for this feature computation. Another DAG is for the model computation logic. Right, so in the feature computation DAC, uh, that can include, for example, um, aggregation and also join. Right, So from a key, we can look up. So for example, uh, if we uh, look at a feature for a member, so from the member, we know the uh, 
in LinkedIn, right, we know the job title, right, of the member, and from the job title, we can look up for more information about uh, the job title, then that that in turn can become a feature for the member, right? So such like join, look up, are all in the DAG that process the feature. Do you run into the issue of kind of the the leaky abstraction problem around features where a team will define a, a feature um, and it has kind of very specific semantics to the problem that they're trying to solve and someone else might find it in a marketplace or catalog and want to use it, but uh, it doesn't quite fit. And, and if you do run into that, how do you address that? Um, yes, I think uh, uh, different teams uh, always, right, uh, may define some feature that is very specific to their application. And in that case, um, well, those features probably won't be that shareable. However, there are a large number of features that can be shared across different applications, especially on the features that capture a user's interest. Right. So, for example, mm-hmm. uh, user's interest in different kinds of jobs can be used to, for example, rank the content, like articles uh, for the user also. Right. right. So, for example, you look at job activity that it, the, a particular user is interested in jobs from a particular company. Then, when we rank articles, then we can potentially rank the articles that about that company higher. Right. So that user can uh, get the value. Mm-hmm. And are the features that groups uh, define and publish out to this marketplace are they? Uh, I'm thinking of like different uh, you know, version control metaphors, like forkable, and and um, I guess mainly that's the one I'm thinking of. Like, can you fork these things and extend them to to make them more to tailor them to specific use cases, or are they kind of more static? Um, so the way that we are managing the features uh, is the following: uh, we try to reduce the dependencies of features on other features. Um, because I think when we have that more and more dependency, then it becomes uh, something that will be difficult to manage. So we tend to treat like, each feature as a uh, independent unit. And if you need to uh, modify the feature, then yeah, to some extent you fork or you copy, and then you make all the changes that become another like independent features. I'm curious, what are the... It's just kind of wrapping up the the feature marketplace component. What are the key things that you've learned in you know in, in kind of producing and supporting this particular component? You know, in terms of the way folks use features and and the you know the most important things to consider when you're thinking about creating some kind of reusability for features. Um, I think something that we learn is that uh, a abstraction layer for feature access is very important. Uh, this abstraction layer gives the user a very simple view of how you uh, can use a feature. Basically, you just refer to a user by its name, right? And uh, uh, then the system basically just automatically figure out where to find the feature and how to extract feature. I think this greatly simplify uh, the way that people use feature. And, and when you refer to features here, it sounds like you're referring to kind of a higher level concept uh, that you know is analogous to a pipeline as opposed to a low level... Uh, uh, you know, I've heard it, you know, sometimes referred to as like a, a, a snapshot in time of data, right? And mm-hmm. so you've got these feature, you've got features, um, then you can kind of fast forward or, or, or kind of go back in time and, and kind of access features at, at different time points and things like that. Are you addressing, does your model address that as well? Um, I think that that is a, a great uh, question. Um, we are currently building <laughs> that capability. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, so uh, the ability of uh, uh, looking at the feature at different time point uh, is a very important uh, functionality. The next part of the of ProML that you mentioned was kind of the the interface for 
kind of building new models, what does that uh, look like from a user perspective? Um, just make sure I understand this correctly. Right? When you say user, you mean the user of machine learning tooling. Right, right. right. The developer. Okay, good. The developer, yes. Over the year, right, we found that uh, uh, there are three types of model that are very useful for LinkedIn application. Uh, one is uh, the tree models. Uh, usually, uh, that is a set of trees, like uh, uh, gradient boosted trees. And a certain type of model we find to be very useful uh, is uh, like deep learning models, right? Those are like neural networks. And a third type of model that we find to be also very useful uh, is uh, a deep uh, personalization model. Right? So those models try to learn a set of model parameters for each individual user. And uh, the tool we provide is a method to allow people to uh, connect or combine different type of model together right, into a DAG structure. Right, so, for example, uh, you can first apply tree models to learn the interactions right, between users and, uh, for example, jobs, right, if we are talking about like job recommendation. And then after that, you may have uh, another model, neural network, right, that try to learn the representation of the member and also learn the representation of uh, uh, jobs. Right, through a neural network, uh, we generate a vector um, that uh, represent the behavior of the user and the behavior of job. And we can combine all this together into features into our deep personalization model. And the tooling well building basically give people the flexibility of uh, uh, pick and choose different type of model and then combine them together into a deck. And then we do uh, model training to train all these models together. Is the implication there that the, the feature marketplace and the, these DAGs has some kind of first-class notion of the, the type of a feature or the type of uh, a feature's inputs or outputs uh, that can be used to, to validate this DAG? Yes. So uh, the type of features what we are currently developing uh, is, well, Tensor, right? So which is pretty much the same as uh, other tools. Uh, however, we want the Tensors to also carry semantic meanings, right? So uh, if you look at, uh, uh, say, TensorFlow, uh, each tensor basically just a, a numeric uh, array of multiple dimensions. But to be able to like, validate the features and also help the developer to understand the feature, uh, we want to add semantic to the dimensions, right? So for example, uh, one dimension of the tensor may represent, for example, skills of the user. Right? Another dimension may represent, uh, for example, companies uh, of a job, for example. Right? So we mm -hmm. want to be able to capture all these semantic meaning and so that our tensor type, when users look at the tensor, they can understand the tensor better. And that can also be used in our uh, later validation. Uh, now that I'm envisioning this, uh, you know, almost kind of a WYSIWYG drag and drop kind of uh, thing. Is that the direction you're headed or are you uh, using more <laughs> of a Jupyter notebook or kind of a code based uh, way of constructing these graphs? Um, yeah, we, we are using code based approach. Uh, rather than I imagine drag. that would be your uh... <laughs> yeah I think uh, yeah drag and drop is easy to create some small DAG right but uh, if you manage a large DAG I think that like, code based is important. Are notebooks uh, a paradigm of of choice at LinkedIn? Uh, yes, uh, we use notebook uh, mainly for data analysis and also uh, the uh, the first stage of modeling. Usually people. Uh, do like prototyping, right? You want to try out different ways of specifying your model. Uh, we use notebook for that. But for our production uh, model training workload, uh, we are not using uh, Jupyter Notebook. Okay. And so it sounds like there's not particularly any uh, effort or interest in integrating the, the notebooks, like automating the notebook to production pipeline. It's it, it's a kind of ad hoc 
analysis tool. And then if someone's going to produce something that eventually is targeting production, they're starting from, uh, you know, they're starting in an IDE more, more yeah. often than not. Yeah, that's correct. That's the current usage. However, we are also evaluating the potential of uh, using notebook for manage that production training, but that's still in the exploration phase. So you've got these, uh, you've got models that are developed in in notebooks and in code, uh, connected via these graphs. I think the next component of ProML is a component that manages the training environments and, and training clusters. Is that right? Uh, yes. Um, the way that we uh, manage training uh, is mainly through uh, 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 Hadoop and the Spark. And our data all stored on Hadoop cluster, and we use Spark to uh, coordinate uh, training of like different types of models. And after training, uh, we uh, need to like, deploy the models into our production environment. Uh, there's another uh, workflow management to take the model we trained uh, fr and the data available on Hadoop, the model available on Hadoop, and deploy that into different places uh, in our production environment. And I think that is a actually quite challenging uh, problem uh, in uh, our uh, system. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, our models are usually very large. Right? In order to be able to uh, model each individual user's behavior, in the model training process, we generate model parameters for each of the individual user. Right? So if you look at the, the size of a uh, machine learning model, Usually that's in the order of tens of billions of parameters. Uh, that uh, amount of model parameters usually cannot fit into a single container. So in, re in reality, we need to deploy parts of the model into, for example, key value store, parts of the model into the, uh, the uh, scoring service, and also part of the model into uh, the index that uh, uh, provide all the items. So that's the complexity uh, that uh, we are dealing with for the model deployment uh, tooling. Okay, uh, and the model, the, is there kind of an automated uh, pipeline to, to kind of overuse the, the term between the, the training tooling and the deployment tooling? Yep, that's right. So. Uh, we are building a uh, web interface. Uh, we call that uh, Model Explorer. Um, people can go to this interface and uh, look at all the previously trained model, and you can publish a model from the interface. And after that, uh, we start the deployment process. And we have a centralized release tool which monitor the deployment process. And uh, this process usually starts with uh, uh, validating the model in a test environment, and then uh, deploy that in one instance uh, in the uh, production service. And to validate that it works well in that one instance, and then deploy it to all the instances right after we validate that it works well for a single instance. So yeah, so this is uh, a tooling what we are we are currently building. Now I remember seeing a while ago um, some work that I think was done at LinkedIn uh, around distributed TensorFlow training on Hadoop. That's correct. Uh, I think you open sourced a, a a project. Is that still uh, in use there? Yes. Yeah. So in LinkedIn, when we uh, train deep learning models, we are mainly use uh, um, TensorFlow and. Uh, uh, in the past, we evaluated uh, using Spark to manage uh, a uh, cluster for TensorFlow model training. Uh, however, uh, that framework uh, didn't work very well. So we developed uh, uh, TensorFlow on Young, uh, which we call like Tony, T stands for TensorFlow, O-N on, 
why uh, Yang, which is uh, a Hadoop uh, cluster management uh, system, and uh, uh, that help us to effectively manage a cluster of uh, machines that we can run a distributed TensorFlow. Yesterday, uh, I talked to a colleague in uh, Spark, uh, apparently with uh, a new release of uh, Spark, Spark 2.4, uh, they provide better support for TensorFlow. I think that's also something interesting to look at. There are a lot of folks working on different ways to do distributed TensorFlow. There's the the Horovod stuff. Uh, there's the distributed TensorFlow that's kind of baked into TensorFlow. It seems like uh, just based on the level of activity that, um, you know, there are either a lot of kind of decisions that, you know, don't work well for, for everyone or the current solutions aren't, aren't uh, you know, folks aren't very happy with what's currently available. Do you have a perspective on that? Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, this is still a, a quite active area. Um, I think probably uh, after half a year, right, we will probably start to see like clear winners. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of the actual computation, right, um, TensorFlow itself right provide uh, distributed training. Uh, however, I think most of the effort is on how to set up a cluster for machines uh, such that we can start um, TensorFlow distributed training. And uh, uh, the key is how to uh, enable a uh, developer right, to very easily right, set up this uh, set of machines and uh, uh, the setup mechanism also interact with uh, uh, TensorFlow uh, very well. Yeah, we've talked about training and and deployment, and you also have uh, an aspect of ProML that's focused on uh, what you call health assurance. Uh, what I'm taking to be kind of model evaluation and performance assessment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think um, after we deploy the model into production and we start to serve uh, user traffic. Uh, it is very important right, to make sure that the model continues to run properly. Uh, there are many things that we want to monitor. Uh, one is that the data quality, right, especially the feature data quality, uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, in the online service, the feature data we receive right, is consistent with uh, the, data, the feature data we observe uh, in our offline training process. And also, uh, we also want to like continue to continuously monitor uh, our feature data distribution, right? So whenever we see a distribution change, uh, then we want to be able to react to that uh, quickly. Right? Usually, distribution change may indicate uh, some problem in our uh, feature generation or feature serving systems. And uh, after people receive the alert, uh, people need to be able to investigate right, the problems uh, in our production system and also the model. So in that uh, area, uh, it's important that we provide a user interface. People can go and look at, and to be able to explain for a particular like, recommendation, right? why we are making this recommendation. People should be able to see uh, all the features and also uh, the model decisions based on these features. How is the distribution even specified? Are you assuming kind of, you know, kind of simple, you know, Gaussian types of distributions and just looking at, you know, means and variances, or is it agnostic to the distribution uh, of the, the actual data? We start by looking at uh, basic statistics, right? So like uh, mean, variance, those are like um, first order and second order moments. And we, can, we also look at some higher uh, order moments. And uh, uh, we also look at uh, the cumulative distribution, right? And compare the difference between the two. When you find that uh, there's been a shift in distribution, and or a model has degrade in predictive performance, are you doing anything where you're kind of automatically triggering retrains or things like that? Or is it more about notifying whoever owns that particular model to take the, the right action? Um, for now, we start with uh, a notification and uh, uh, we are uh, building methods which can 
also trigger this retrend, but we have not yet gone there. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that's a yeah important next direction. And are you also um, doing things like canary models or A/B testing? You know, where you're kind of varying the amount of traffic that you're sending to a, a model on the fly. Yeah, A/B testing is a very very important. Uh, aspect. And uh, uh, for all of our machine learning development, uh, we use A-B testing, right, to uh, verify and uh, quantify the improvement, right, of a new model that we launch in production. And at LinkedIn, we have a A-B testing platform that is widely used in all the products. Uh, it's not only for machine learning, but for any uh, product feature change, we are also doing A-B testing uh, because we want to make decision based on measurable uh, results. You're able to use the existing A-B testing platform that's, you know, I, I imagine was in place for, you know, switching out, you know, copy and images and things like that on web pages uh, with the with models as well? Did it require a lot of retooling to be able to uh, support use with the machine learning models? The way it works is uh, pretty much the same. Uh, So basically uh, we have different treatments, right? So, and we allocate uh, user traffic to different treatment. And each treatment has a key and uh, uh, that key uh, basically, then it all depends on how we interpret that key, right? So for uh, experimenting with product feature, then uh, in our product we use that key, right, to decide, right, which uh, which uh, experience we want to show to a user. And for ma- for machine learning uh, experiment, uh, we use that key pretty much to decide like which uh, model ID we want to pick up, right, to serve the user. So at the infrastructure level, it's pretty similar. One thing that we didn't talk about earlier on in the, you know, relating more to model development and and training to some extent is uh, experiment management. Does ProML provide a feature set for data scientists to help them manage the various experiments that they're running? Um. So this is an area that uh, uh, we will be looking into in the future. So currently, uh, our A-B uh, test uh, platform provide reasonably support uh, for like managing the experiment that we run. Uh, but these are mostly user-facing experiment, right? right? Those are running online. Uh, for offline experiments, um, that is an area that uh, like we are currently building to be able to uh, allow a user to see uh, all the past experiment and enable them to compare different models in terms of their performance and also the difference in their features and also the difference in their uh, the type of models uh, are using. This is like one of the next steps that we are we are looking into. And that ties to uh, hyperparameter optimization, which is something that you mentioned earlier. It sounds like you do uh, offer via the platform some capability there. Uh, That's correct. Um, So to train a machine learning model, usually we need to set up different uh, like tuning parameters. Uh, For example, uh, if you do uh, a regression model, then usually you have regularization terms, right? Then you need to specify the regularization weights. And uh, also uh, when you do like neural net models, uh, there are also like many hyperparameters you need to decide. And what we do is that we develop a, a Bayesian optimization method right, that sequentially uh, try out different uh, hyperparameter settings. And based on that, right, we learn uh, the distribution of a potential best parameter setting. And then based on that, we pick the next step. And uh, through this iterative process, we find like better and the better uh, parameter settings. It sounds like ProML, as one would expect, is kind of in constant evolution. What's been the experience in bringing these uh, these features to the users of the system, the developers? Do you 
have you, I mean, I'm just curious really about observations in terms of, you know, for folks that, you know, have some community of uh, machine learning engineers or data scientists that they're supporting and you know, want to bring uh, platform features to them to make them more efficient. Do you have any uh, advice as to, you know, where to start or how to proceed or the best ba- way to, to work with uh, with that community to give them the tools that they really need? I think when uh, for people to start uh, using machine learning, uh, I would recommend to start from uh, simple uh, methods and then gradually build complexity. And I think currently many cloud platforms right, provide uh, capability of building and managing uh, simple models. Uh, by simple, I mean that uh, the model size is not very large and also the size of data is not very large, right? And then uh, gradually you can add more complexity. And by, by, uh, and for those simple models, I think uh, Jupyter Notebook is a perfect uh, place to get started. And then when you add more and more complexity, then you may need to uh, train your model on a large amount of data. And for that, um, I would probably recommend the listeners right, to take a look at uh, Photom ML, which is a LinkedIn open source uh, project which can enable you to train your models on a large amount of data uh, using uh, Spark and do very uh, good and deep uh, personalization. And then uh, after that, uh, when you have uh, those complex and large models, uh, uh, you need to start to worry about how to deploy model into your production systems. Um, I think currently that is still a challenge. Um, I think after we solve the problem, and we c- I can share more uh, of the practices. <laughs> Watch this space is definitely a quickly evolving area. That's right. So you started this in, in describing a, a goal of increasing uh, developer uh, productivity. productivity, and in fact, uh, Pro ML stands for pr- uh, productive machine learning. Have you? kind of benchmarked uh, productivity gains of the developer community as they've used this platform? Uh, We start to measure productivity uh, in our uh, LinkedIn uh, 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 machine learning applications. Um, We we just get started. And what we look at is the number of successful experiments per engineer. Right, so uh, we want to uh, improve or increase the value right, that a, a single uh, machine learning engineer can produce. And the way that we measure the value right, is by looking at uh, how many successful experiments that the, a single engineer uh, can do by using the tooling. Uh, I think over time, uh, we will be able to uh, quantify the gain of the tooling we are building. And this is still uh, a process that we are going through. Awesome. Well, Bichong, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us about what you're up to. It is really interesting stuff, and uh, I learned a ton. Oh, thank you so much. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Bichong or any of the topics covered in this episode, visit twimmelaicom slash talk slash 200. To learn more about our AI platform series or to download our ebooks, visit twimmelaicom slash AI platforms. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.